if you're doing. Thank you. Okay, so it's Romans chapter 8 on page 797, chapter 8, verse 12, all the way through to 17. Okay. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who, got, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Would you like to turn with, uh, with me to that? Romans chapter 8 um, uh, and verse 12. And can I just add my welcome, um, especially if you're a visitor here. Um, uh, if I haven't had a chance to say hello to you, it's good to have you with us. We've been working through this book of Romans on Sunday mornings, um, and we do need God's help uh, uh, as we do that. So please join me as we pray now. Heavenly Father, we, we, we might want you to bless... Uh, success for us in all sorts of different areas but we too father want to pray this morning that we might know you um, that you might help us to see you and uh, father we pray for your help in that now as we turn to your word help me uh, in speaking help us all as listeners we pray um, that you might change us that we might live for you for we ask this in jesus name amen amen so Romans chapter 8 and, and reading from verse 12, which is where we've got to. Um, I mentioned uh, in the last couple of weeks about how I became a Christian at the age of 30 um, and how when I became a Christian, I, I, I retrained quite quickly um, and moved out of banking into teaching. Um, and I want to just relate to you what happened at the time. I remember um, when I got the letter accepting me for a place at college to retrain as a teacher, um, everything changed very, very quickly. A great excitement uh, about that enveloped me. I absorbed myself in this idea of, of, of teaching. Um, and it was for months I kind of lived and breathed the idea of uh, retraining as a, a teacher. I was utterly passionate about this new direction in which my life was uh, heading and that I felt I was standing on the edge of. Um, I can remember, for example, getting quite excited about the edition of the Times Educational Supplement that comes out every week. Some of you teachers might be aware of that. Just being excited for the day that it arrived. And when it did, pouring over it and making, cutting out loads of little bits, little articles, and actually cataloguing them uh, and, and uh, filling scrapbooks with these, um, uh, with these d snippets. Some of you are looking at me like, I can't imagine you do such a, such a thing. And it's a good example, isn't it, of how my own life at that point was kind of enveloped in this excitement um, that had been brought about by a change in, in my life at, at, at that time. I went to trade shows. I went to conferences about teaching. It was all very exciting and very new in that sense. Um, maybe you know somebody who's... Uh, whose character, uh, behavior and outlook has changed like that uh, when something came into their life, when something changed. Um, maybe it happens sometimes when we get a new job. Maybe it's when we start a new relationship with somebody. Uh, maybe it can come with a new house, a large possession like that. We get a sense of excitement uh, that comes with that. Um, well, the whole Bible, and this book of Romans in particular, is an invitation into the ultimate project. Um, the ultimate extreme makeover for your life and my life. God's grand design. I've used two TV references there. Did you, did you get them? God's grand design. And what is that? What is God's big purpose that we really want to see and worship him for this morning? Well, it's this. A world without sin. 
a world without sin. Now, I appreciate I've just said the S word, so I do think it's necessary for me to clarify that. What, what, what am I saying? Sin is not so much the things we do as what we are. It's our nature. At the heart of it is a radical self-centeredness that is hostile to God, to the God who made us and, and loved us. That's what we've been finding out in Romans. And that's all of us, and God could have flattened us because of that. He could have flattened us, but he didn't. The great news of, of, of the great news of Christianity is that God so loved the world that he sent his son to be a sin offering at the cross to bear the anger that my sin deserves. And the Bible says that one day Jesus will return and fairly judge us all. All those who broke God's law will be punished for eternity in hell. But those who believed in Jesus and had their sins forgiven will live with him forever. In a new world, what we tend to think of or call heaven, but the Bible calls the new heavens and the new earth, where everything will be perfect, a world without sin. I'm going to say something controversial now. Not everyone is going to agree with me, I think. Speak is not heaven. I know it feels like it sometimes. Oh, I'm not going to be able to carry that for very long, am I? No, I, I, I can't carry that for very long. Um, we probably all agree, don't we, uh, that we are not living in that place at the moment. We know that, don't we? But how often do we actually stop and consider that sin is the cause of everything that is wrong in the world that we're living in now? Everything that is wrong on our estate. Every broken home. Every single mum and child. Sorry, every single, every single child without a mum or a dad. Every diagnosis of cancer. Every tear of a little boy or a little girl. Every argument. Every disappointment. It's all caused by sin. And you know, we ought to really hate sin, hadn't we, when we think about that? And we ought to really worship the God whose grand design is to get rid of it. The good news is that we don't sit and wait for that perfect world to come. The good news is that when, any, when, when God makes any man or woman, boy or girl, a Christian, he catches them up to participate in his sin-crushing grand design right here and right now. And that puts life's little projects like the one I started with into some perspective, doesn't it? When we think about that grand plan, God's grand design, which is to get rid of sin, that horrible sin that we just thought about, not just then, not just then in the future, but right here and right now. And this paragraph here in Romans is going to show us how that happens, how that happens. And the first thing it says is it happens by putting us under an obligation. So will you have a look at verse 12 with me? Let me read it and we'll see what it means. By putting us under an obligation. Verse 12, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, that is, if you do not belong to Christ, you will die. You will be, what he means there is you'll be eternally separated from God. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. I'm going to use an illustration now. Oh dear, it's not a very manly one. I'm sorry, guys. Um, it's a gardening illustration. Um, having said that, gardening is the most sanctified hobby that there is. It is, it is what everybody is moving towards, uh, you know, the, the joy of gardening. I appreciate there are other hobbies out there like cycling and things like that, which are 
so-so. But if you grow in holiness, you grow towards gardening. So, you know, I appreciate it's not very manly, but uh, let me use this illustration. Um, Because I think a lot of us uh, see it. See this sort of thing. Do you like do, do you like seeing the, the the spring bulbs at the moment as they push up through the through the earth? Yeah. Um, so the the daffodils and the snowdrops and the crocuses and the, the tulips and the other things um, popping up where back in the autumn the leaves were going yellow first of all, yeah, and then brown. And then just dying away. And now we see popping up that, that new life. Um, I wonder, a lot of people enjoy that. They love to see the bulbs coming up. What is it inside of us that makes us kind of drawn to that, to, to, to enjoy that? Whether, whether we would say gardening is a hobby or not. Um, what is it that makes that so appealing, that uh, revitalization that we see? Well, perhaps because it's one of the closest images, illustrations God has given us to the revitalization that we, we were made for. You see, in the few sentences before this one that we've just broken into, in, in, in number 12, Paul has described the true status for someone belonging to Christ. And he said, although their body is getting old and dying like anyone else, because that happens to Christians, their new life in Christ is welling up inside of them at the same time more and more. They're dying. Their new life in Christ is welling up inside of them more and more. You see it in the faces and in the behaviors of some older Christians, don't you? Um, that, that, that joy and that life, even though they face the same trials and the troubles as everyone else. Um, And not only that, Paul has said, but the the indwelling spirit guarantees that their body will one day be be made new and resurrected. It's a very beautiful uh, description of the status uh, of a Christian in the present. And it's because of that, Paul says, immediately he says, therefore, because of that, because of that picture, that I've given you there, the gardening illustration, because of that picture of, of life that Paul has described of a Christian status, because that is true, he says, we have an obligation to align ourselves with that which, which has brought that about, a life according to the Spirit. We don't owe our sinful nature anything, because that nature is just heading for death. That nature hasn't given us any benefit for which we ought to thank it or respond by serving its desires. And just before we move on, I want you to notice how God comes gently to accomplish his grand plan. He puts us under obligation. Do you notice that? Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Do you know, if I was God... I'd put it beyond doubt, wouldn't you? It'd be like, I'd be, want to grab the controls and say, this is what we're going to do, all right? This is how we're going to do it and take control. God doesn't do that. What does he say? Therefore, brothers, we, you, we have an obligation. And we sometimes sing that song. You know it? Wonderful grace. Wonderful grace. And we sing, that gives me the time to change. God was so patient. We've, we've sung this morning about his, God is um, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger. God was patient with me, and he continues to be patient with me in my Christian life. But let's, let's just return to God's grand design and our, our part in that right here and right now. Because it says in verse 13, 13 and 14, Have a look at it with me. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We need to understand uh, here this morning, what does it mean by putting to death the misdeeds of the body? What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Joe, could you, if you've got that slide, could you just put that up for a moment? Because I think it's quite helpful to look at that verse 13 and 14 in this way. Because I want to draw out some important things. Um, First of all, Paul says that those who belong to Christ are indwelt 
are, are, are indwelt by the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, and they will live because they are sons of God. That, that's, at, that's at the top there. Can you see? If by the Spirit of if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those who are indwelt by the Spirit will live because they are sons of God. Okay? And also in that verse, Paul is drawing a parallel between putting to death the misdeeds of the body and those who are led by the Spirit. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Do you see, do you see we could almost put an equal between the, the two bits of green. If by the Spirit of God you put to death the misdeeds of the body, equals those who are led by the Spirit of God. Or we might say the result of being led by the Spirit of God is the putting to death of the misdeeds of the body. Now that, that might sound like a moot point. That's a very important point. That's a very important point because there's a lot of guff and a lot of kind of um, snobbery that surrounds the idea of being led by the Spirit. Have you heard that phrase before, being led by the Spirit? And there's lots of guff and snobbery about it. Do you know, the last time someone said to me, quite seriously, the Spirit of God told me to do this. Well, the circumstances were these. I was reflecting on it. These were the circumstances. Number one, they told me they'd heard a voice in their head. Okay. Secondly, what God told them to do would flatly contradict what he said elsewhere plainly in the Bible. And thirdly, what they felt the Spirit of God was leading them to do would result in nothing whatever to do with anything that resembles putting to death the misdeeds of their body. Okay? Martin Luther, he was a famous uh, Christian of the 16th century. He put it like this. This is what he says about this. Such leading excludes all fanaticism, all auto-suggestion, all hearing of imaginary, fictitious, inward voices. The next time somebody says to you, the Spirit of God is telling me to do this or that, I think it would be a good idea to ask them, what particular sin would the Spirit of God have you be putting to death in that which you're proposing? Now, I'm not denying here that God can speak to a person, but in my experience, it's rarely got any kind of correspondence with a repentant posture in the person that's, um, that's being supposedly led by this voice. I mean, when I hear voices in my head, they're normally leading me in the very opposite direction to conformity to, 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 to holiness, if you like. So it's really important, when we, because we hear that expression an awful lot, being led by the Spirit, and we can see in the, in the way that Paul is, 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 is showing us in those verses that it is, it, is, it is to do with putting to death the misdeeds of the body. So how does the Spirit of God, if it's leading in that way, how does it do that in a Christian? Well, it's where we finish this morning. It's in verses 15 and 16. And we're going to look at those verses and I'm going to give you an example because I think that might be the best way of doing that. So would you like to just have a look at verses 15 and 16, and we'll read them in a moment. We're going to read 15 and 16, and through into 17, and these are the things I want you to listen out for. Um, the way in which the Spirit of God leads a Christian in the putting to death of the misdeeds of the body. These are the things to listen out for. The, the, the indwelling Spirit of God makes me decisively and radically aware of, of the death which my old way was, was, was heading in. Okay. The secondly, the indwelling Spirit of God makes me aware that I am God's Son and that he is my Father. The third thing the indwelling Spirit of God does is make me aware of my, my royal inheritance. And the fourth thing it does is to impress on me the privilege of sharing in in Jesus' own suffering. Let's read those verses. Verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, I'm going to try and, 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 and land this this morning with, with an illustration with how I think verses 12 to 17 all works to the glory of God and his grand design and plan to be rid of sin not just then, but now. Okay, with an illustration. Okay, and I want to use the example of of because uh, there are all sorts of ones I could have chosen, but I want to use the example of sexual sin. Sexual sin, which could take all sorts of different forms uh, among us this morning. We could be talking about pornography. We could be talking about lust. We could be talking about same-sex attraction. We could be talking about sex outside of marriage. Um, other forms of marital unfaithfulness, any of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, now, I've chosen this particular one as an illustration because I think, first of all, it helps us to iron out the kind of problems that come when we hear about the misdeeds of the body. Because that's sometimes automatically what we think of, sexual sins, when we think of, of that. But I think we, it'd be good for us to iron out what, what, what we mean there. And secondly, because it's an area that I continue to struggle in, and I reckon 99% of people here do presently, one day will, or have in the past struggled. It's a very human uh, matter, an issue. It's an example. If it's not your thing, try it with the sin that you're struggling with at the moment. There's something that presses in on you that you're aware of more. Use the example as I work through it to think about that. Okay? But let's look at it as an example. Verse 13 says that by the Spirit I put to death the misdeeds of the body. And straight away someone will say, there you go, you Christians are always going on about the body and how bad the body is and sex is bad and you're all just such a killjoy. Yeah? Well, Paul wants you, if you belong to Christ this morning, to picture at the point of temptation, put that to one side, he wants you to picture a struggle going on between the new control tower and the old control tower pictures that we were using yesterday the new the new you inside if you've been made a christian by the spirit and the old control tower the sinful nature going on at the deepest level inside and in the case of of sex the new control tower says that there are some things that god says about sex and about relationships that are right there are these there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong And it's not my place, and I haven't got time this morning to show you where and why those things, but they would include, in the area of sex, for example, um, sex only in heterosexual marriage um, and marriage for life. They would include no adultery. They would include no pornography, etc. Okay? So that's the new control tower telling us those things. The old control tower, of course, says giddy up to those things and a whole host of other stuff. So to put to death the misdeeds of the body isn't to say desire for sexual intimacy is wrong, because it isn't. God made us and he made our sexual appetites. It's not about resenting and rejecting the fact that we've got natural bodies and natural bodily appetites. And it's not a mental exercise to try to find enjoyment in resenting and rejecting those bodies and the appetites that God's given us. It's not those things often people think of when they hear Christians talk about putting to death the misdeeds of the body. It is this. It is to say, I know... As a believer, I know something is evil in God's sight. And so I'm going to take decisive and radical action against it. I'm going to, as it were, to use the the languages Paul is using here, I'm going to put it to death. And in the case of sexual temptation, um, 
in my life, it ha- that has meant at various times in my life these kinds of things. That that uh, that putting to death, that radical and decisive action in my own life has meant some of these things at different times. It has meant binning the pawn. It has meant reading a thoughtful book that a Christian has written about, about that struggle, about these kinds of struggles too. It has meant installing software on my computer to help in that sort of thing. And I know lots of you will say, I know the force of temptation when it comes... uh, Sex is a good example because we feel the force of temptation when it comes to to that very deeply, very often. And I want to say to you this morning, I know the force of that temptation myself. And I know that on my own, it's absolutely impossible for me to do anything about that. I might like to build rules around my life, but it's just impossible for me to do it on my own. But I'm not on my own, this passage says. The Spirit of God leads me and helps me in that. So how? How does the Spirit lead me in, in those things? Well, firstly, remember what we were saying before. God, by his Spirit, makes me aware of the death to which my old life was headed. God says to me that this sexual sin, it's like this, it goes something like this. This sexual sin, this, this evil, Anthony, this is evil. Once you were a slave to that sin and it made you cower in God's presence and live in fear, always afraid of facing God inevitably and finding that all your fears, the wor- your worst fears and your worst worries were right. It, it, it was wrong and God was right to be angry with it. So I lived in fear. So the, so the Spirit of God comes and it reminds me of that. It reminds me. and tells me you don't want to go back there. But secondly, it says, the Spirit of God makes me aware that I'm a son of God and that he is my father. If you belong to Christ, let me tell you, at some point in that temptation, a thought will be introduced into you. A thought that says, you're mine. You're mine. I have adopted you. And we all know that adopted children are, they're extra special Because adopted children have been chosen by their parents, haven't they? Christian, do you know, do you ever pause to, do we we pause and remember that even before God created the very first thing, he said, I want you. A thought is introduced, I am his and, and he is mine. So verse 15, and by the Spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Will you, will you try this with me? Um, what, what, the first two letters of the alphabet, can you say them together? Sort of run them together quickly. Abba, 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 Abba. Two first two letters of the alphabet. Abba, Abba. Yeah, some of you are doing it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same in Greek. It's, it's, it's a child's first mumblings. Abba, 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 Abba. When we can't do anything else, I mean, let's face it, when it comes to the force of temptation, that's, that's absolutely right, isn't it? We can cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And let me ask you this morning, Christian, what do you cry when you fall into sin? Maybe what do you cry when you fall into deep sin? You know, I can think back to the times when I've fallen in deep sin and all I've been able to say is, Oh, Father. Oh, Father. It's as much as I've been able to say. Do you know, have you, have you known that yourself? But it's at that point that I'm ready to be able to put to death the misdeeds of the body. The Spirit has reminded me at that point, you're, you're my son, and I'm yours. Or, or how about this, what do we cry at the deepest moment of sadness? You experienced like real deep moments of sadness. My, my dad died suddenly of a heart attack on the 2nd of October 2002. 
So he was quite a young man. Um, I cried at the time, I remember. I cried, oh, Father, oh, Father. Talking to, to, to my God, my Father in heaven. It's all I, could, all I could say at the time, but I said it over and over and over again. It was enough at the time. Oh, Father, oh, Father, oh, Father. You don't hear non-Christians cry, Father, ever, do you? They may say, God this, or they may say, God that. Or, why does God allow suffering? Or, oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a particular Christian believer's response, isn't it, to say, oh Father, Abba, Father. And the last two, well, we haven't got time to develop those, but God by his spirit makes me aware of my royal inheritance. And God by his spirit impresses on me the privilege of sharing in, in Jesus' suffering. And those, those thoughts are introduced at the time of temptation. And that is how God catches us, up, catches us all up in his grand design to get rid of sin. I'm going to try and wrap it up now to finish. And it's to get rid of sin, not just then, and it's great that that's coming, but isn't it great that that's happening now as well in your life if you're a believer? And I want to say this morning that it's a million miles away from the person who doesn't belong to Christ but feels bad about something in their life and wants it to be better. I'm aware that that happens. It may well actually be a great way in which the Spirit of God is awakening you, beginning to awaken you to think about these things. But what, I've been, what we've been looking at here is a million miles away from just anybody else who just kind of feels bad about something that's happening in their life. And I, I do want to make that invitation to anybody here this morning. If you're not sure whether you belong to Christ, we would like to help you at the beginning of that path. Because it is, it is only faith in, in what Christ has done at the cross by which we receive God's indwelling spirit and by which, by the spirit, we put to death the misdeeds of the body. That's what this is talking about here. But we'd like to help you, help you to see this Jesus, see what God has done. And we'd lo lo love to be able to do that. So it's my invitation. Please speak to me, speak to Steve, uh, speak to one of the elders here, speak to somebody that, uh, that you know from the church. We can, we'd love to, 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 to help you to see that. But if you're a believer this morning, um, hopefully the Spirit of God has been uh, you know, applying what we've been looking at as we've been going along. But let me just p pull out a few uh, implications of some of this teaching. Okay. Um, Hadn't we ought to this morning be praising God that we've been drawn up into this, uh, this life that is truly life? God's big plan, God's grand design to eradicate sin, not just then, but now. Yeah, wonderful that God has drawn us up to that big plan. However, however much those other smaller plans in our lives that I began with might seem to dominate, that that's the really big plan. That's the great thing. Um, and we've been drawn up into that. So let's commit, you know, let's be committed again to realigning our lives with that big, with that big plan. We're part of it today. It's a really great and wonderful and exciting thing. Let's thank God for the leading and the prompting of his spirit. Let's thank him for the voice introduced, the thought introduced into life situation, into the life's situations of temptation. Are we, are we praying for that? Are we welcoming it when it comes? Let's be wary when we hear people talking about being led by the Spirit in the, in the sense that we've thought a little bit more carefully about, about what that means here. Um, or where we ourselves might be th tempted to think in unbiblical ways about what it means to be led by the Spirit. Let's not be surprised that growing as a Christian will lead us in suffering and hardship because none of the desires of the sinful nature are going to be invitations to miserableness, are they? We know that. They all, they all whisper, you'll be happier, you'll be more secure, you'll have more pleasures. And putting those voices to death will hurt. So we hadn't ought to be surprised that that's what the Christian life is like. And let's do all that we can to encourage one another, as we do with the singing, as we do with the 
as we as we talk and share among ourselves about those those ways in which the spirit of god comes to us in those in those times and and leads us as it were to put to death the misdeeds of the body Do you remember those four areas um, fear of the former way just a, a, a real uh, honest remembrance of where that all led and how awful that was that uh, sonship the reminder of your sonship of your royal inheritance which we haven't had time to look at and the suffering now glory then the pattern of Christ let's let's just be talking about those things let's be singing about them let's be rejoicing in them let's be reminding one another of them and and just to finish you know remember Paul's purpose in Romans was he was he was trying to get guys to come with him on mission wasn't he and he and he knew that and he was also trying to get people in the church to be be more united together and he knew that the gospel was the way in which that would both of those things would happen so how does some of this truth we've looked at today how does that sort of humble us so that we get on better together well, well, maybe we remember that we are growing in holiness, not through what we do, but because God has given us his spirit and he's helping us to grow in that direction. And secondly, let's, let's, when we think about mission, let's think that um, what, what, when we look at our estate, what are you hoping people will do? Are you hoping that they will change their behavior? Are you hoping that things will be better as people, people do Christian things? Well, we need to remember from, from this passage that the thing that matters more than anything else is people need to be born again. People need to be reborn by the Spirit of God because only with the Spirit of God can we be led by the Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body and, 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 and cooperate and participate in God's grand design. So let's make that our focus. And we sometimes forget that, don't we? We're tempted to see change of behavior instead of transformation in people. Let's make that the, the, the big goal. Well, thank you for listening and, 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 and going with me on that. There's some dense stuff in there, wasn't there, in order to understand. Um, but we're going to sing uh, a song which we, which we, which we mentioned in the, in the service to finish. Um, Wonderful Grace. And I've chosen this song to sing because... It does have that verse in it, wonderful grace that gives me the time to change. Um, It's a reminder again that we're under an obligation. um, And that's beautifully, wonderfully gentle of God to put us under obligation to participate in his his grand design. So let's stand together and sing wonderful grace. Hopefully um, the Lord has been speaking to you in a particular way about a particular thing. So let's bow our heads and just do business with him personally and ourselves at anything that um, in our own lives and then I'll finish with a short few sentences so let's bow our heads and and just uh, turn to the Lord ourselves for a few moments Heavenly Father will the the gentle way in which you come to us and dwell in us and put us under obligation to to live in the direction of life. We thank you, Father, for that life that Paul has described. And, Father, we pray that you would help us to align our lives with the Spirit of God. We thank you, Father, that that is a spirit that reminds us of uh, of where our lives were heading before you were gracious to us, that reminds us of our sonship and you, our Father, that reminds us of our inheritance, and it reminds us of, of, of Christ's glory through suffering. And so, Father, we pray that uh, you would fill us with your Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would help us to welcome your Spirit's work in our lives. And we pray, Father, that we would rejoice as those who have been indwelt by your spirit and who are helped and caught up in your big plan to see sin, the vileness of sin, put away, not just then but now, in the, in the here and now. So thank you, Father, for, for, for catching us up in all of that. 
And we pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to think on those things this week. In Jesus' name, amen.